question. But anyways, we are finishing up our sermon series uh, in Ephesians 6. So if you have your Bibles, that's where we're going to start off today. And um, we've so far talked about a lot of things. Uh, We've talked about the belt of truth, which truth is that which corresponds to reality. Um, There is truth in the Word of God. We should expect when we read the Bible, the Bible should reflect what is real and what is true. We've talked about the breastplate of righteousness, the fact that we need to do what is right. And one of Satan's schemes against us is to remove truth from our culture. And so to say something like all truth is relative um, or what's true for you is true for you, what's true for me is true for me. And these things are self-defeating statements. They can't be true in and of themselves. They end up breaking down when they're applied um, to the law of non-contradiction. And then we talked about the breastplate of righteousness, how we need to do what is right. If Satan can trap us to do what is wrong, remember we said this, when, when it's easy to sin, it's easier to sin. It's like eating something that you shouldn't, like a donut or a piece of cake or whatever. Once you have one, it's easier to have two. When you break your diet, you just kind of throw your hands up in the air and you're like, well, diet's already ruined. And we have applied that to some other sins, uh, thoughts or actions or whatever. We've talked about the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace is this piece of armor that lets us know that we are at peace with God. Satan wants nothing more than to trick you into thinking that you are at war with God. God is your enemy. He is against you. And even if he is on your side, he is a judgmental, mean-spirited person who's ready to crack the whip at any moment's notice. But the gospel can bring peace between us and God, and the gospel can can bring peace between ourselves. We've talked about the shield of faith. Faith is to be persuaded by evidence. And so we believe in the supernatural or that which we don't see because of what we do see. The reason why I believe in some of the supernatural things that are found in the gospel is because Jesus resurrected from the dead and there's good evidence to support that. And so our shield of faith protects us from Satan's fiery arrows. We talked about the helmet of salvation, blessed assurance. We are saved. Assurance is not a dirty word. We can trust that when God says, I love you and I'm going to save you, we can count um, him as true. We can trust in what he says. Salvation is not a spiritual yo-yo. It's not we're saved one moment and not saved the next and just up and down based off of our emotions. We can plant our feet firm in the truth that we are saved. And when our feet are planted firm in the truth of that, then we don't let Satan get into our mind and into our heart and deceive us of what we can be assured for. And then finally, we talked about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We looked at some of the evidence for the truthfulness of God's Word. We looked at some of the manuscript evidence. Uh, We looked at some of the historical evidence. We made a cumulative argument last week about how God's Word is trustworthy. And if God's Word is trustworthy, we can trust what it says. Today we are going to end our sermon series on battleground, talking about the power of prayer. And it is something that usually people forget when they, when they talk about the armor of God. Because it's not specifically listed in the armor. But it is there, and it is part of the armor. The power of prayer is one of the most important aspects in this spiritual battle that we can put on. And if I were to define prayer, prayer is simply God talk. When you have a relationship with someone, you talk with them. You message them, you email them, you call them, you sit around the dinner table and you speak with them and you talk with them. That is, that is part of the relationship. And the reason ultimately why we pray all comes back to the idea that we want to be grounded in a relationship with God. But prayer does some really powerful things. And so we're going to go through some examples about the power of prayer. But before we do that, I do want to read Ephesians chapter 6 starting in verse 18. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn open, and we're going to read this together. If you have your phones, you can use your Bible on your phones or whatever um, you choose. But here's what Paul has to say. He ends this section on the armor of God with this. With all prayer and petition, these are requests, pray at all times in the Spirit. Pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view... Be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all saints. And then look at what Paul specifically wants us to pray for. And pray on my behalf, Paul says, that utterance may be given to me and the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. 
that in proclaiming it, I may speak it boldly as I ought to speak. And so he ends this section of scripture with this, pray and be on alert. You know, one of the things that Satan wants to do, and if I was your enemy, if I was Satan working against you, I would try to cut you off from having a vibrant, active, powerful relationship with God. And one of the ways that I would do that, and we talked about this last week, is I would exhaust you or I would entertain you to the point where you don't really want to pray. And if you do pray, it's only for a a, a short few moments because really it's quite boring right? Prayer is quite boring. I mean, it's not entertaining at all, or you're so exhausted, you really can't bring yourself to pray. That is Satan's scheme. That is Satan's tactic, to entertain you to death, to exhaust you to death, to cut you off from a vibrant, active prayer life with God. When's the last time you sat down and spent 15 minutes in prayer with God? Total silence, and you just prayed. It should be something that we do every day, And one of the things that I try to encourage people to do who don't have an active, vibrant prayer life is reflect on the Psalms. Read the Psalms. These are are songs. These are prayers that are offered up to God. And start like this, in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening time, and then any time you eat. Start there. Now, the ultimate goal is to pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean we are constantly always having to pray as if we're trying to, I'm trying to preach while at the same time trying to pray. That's not what he's talking about. What he is talking about is having an active, vibrant relationship with God that is grounded in God talk, talking to God about anything and everything. And then notice what Paul said in Ephesians 6, be on alert. There's something supernatural that happens in prayer that you are able to gain perspective on what is happening in your life and what God is wanting to reveal to you in your life. Prayer is powerful. There are some times when I go to God in prayer because something has happened, um, I'm upset about something and I'm angry, and I lash out at God and in prayer and all of a sudden I feel this conscience of rebuke, the spirit working on my mind, giving me perspective. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe Satan is scheming against me or against them, trying to provoke us to division and jealousy. Prayer gives us the opportunity to be on alert. Watch out. What is really going on here? There are things that we can get upset about all the time. Husbands and wives, parents, church members. But when we step back and we take a moment to just pray about the situation, we can pray in the Spirit and we can see things from God's perspective. Do you know what it means to pray in the Spirit? It's simple. Pray under the influence of the Spirit. Now here's a question. If you are not busy doing spiritual things, if you're not busy living under the influence of the Spirit, what is going to be reflected in your prayer life? Remember, if you're not busy doing spiritual things, you will be doing sinful things. But if you are busy doing spiritual things, you won't be doing sinful things. So if our life is actively engaged in pursuing spiritual things, when it comes to our prayer life, we won't be distracted with the things of the flesh. We'll be able to see things as they truly are. And that's why Paul says, pray and be on alert. But then he adds in something else, this word perseverance. Do not give up. It reminds me when Jesus talks in the Gospels, he gives this parable, this illustration of a widow who just would not give up. She kept praying, she kept asking, she kept looking, she was relentless in her prayer life. And when you are in a fight and you are in a battle, you get exhausted. It gets tiring. You get tired of fighting. You get tired of praying for the same thing over and over again. You get tired of defending yourself and speaking up for truth. You get tired when you're sharing the gospel at work and people reject you time and time again. But Paul says, I want you to pray. Be on alert with all perseverance. Now, have you ever asked yourself this question? If I'm supposed to pray according to God's will, and God's will is going to be be done regardless of what I do, why should I pray? Have you ever asked yourself that question? If God's will is going to be done, no matter what I say or what I do, why should I even bother to pray? I'm either going to be saved or I'm not. This thing is either going to happen or it isn't. And if ultimately God is sovereign and his will is going to be done, why in the world should I take a few moments to pray? God's will is going to be done regardless. Well, here's the interesting thing about God. There are two things I'd like to say about this. Number one, just because God foreknows something is going to happen does not make God casually responsible for something happen, happening. Let me give you an illustration. This is from a world-renowned philosopher, William Lane Craig. He says, if I presented my wife two plates, one had cookies on it and the other had liver and onions on it, 
I may know what my wife is going to choose, but that doesn't mean I'm going to cause her to choose the cookies, right? So just because God has foreknowledge of everything that's going to happen does not mean that God is going to cause everything to happen. Does that make sense? So it doesn't mean he's going to cause you to sin. It doesn't mean he's going to cause your body to be struck with cancer. It doesn't mean he's going to cause a beloved to be lost. And so we need to have that kind of perspective when it comes to prayer, is that just because God foreknows it does not mean God causes it. But here's the other thing that I want to let you know about the providence of prayer, is that God is so sovereign and so in control, he will leave it up, his ultimate decision, to the free will choice that you and I make. For instance, God would tell Israel time and time again, if you repent, I will change my decision. If you change and you repent and you turn away from your sin, I will relent my wrath on you. And God gives us the opportunity to intervene with prayer, and he can literally change the course of his providence for our life, for our country, for our culture, based off of whether or not we pray. And so prayer really does matter. And here's how I look at it, okay? God's will is ultimately going to be done. But I have the opportunity to change the course of my history through, the, through my active life in prayer. Because God may give me that choice. But if I don't pray, there is zero chance of anything changing. Let's say I have a disease. God says if they pray, I will divinely intervene and cure their body. Well, if we never pray, that could never happen. Let's say we love somebody who is lost and they don't come to church, and they're not a Christian, and they've given up on their faith, and we say, well, God's will is going to be done anyways. But God says, if my people would pray, I could divinely intervene and change their circumstance. God is at work through the power of prayer. Don't let it fool you. Satan wants to undermine your prayer life because it ultimately undermines your relationship with God. And so we need to be like the persistent widow. We need to be people who always pray. Jesus asked this question in Luke 8, 18. Will I even find faith on the earth when I return? Will I find people who are still behind prayer? And you know, I look at situations that happened over the last couple days, really horrific, tragic situations, people choosing to use their weapons to produce mass harm and kill and wound and hurt people and children and families. And it's such a horrific impact. And you get online and you see people who do go in prayer, but then you see other people who are so frustrated by the situation, they view prayer as the apathetic choice. And as Christians, we should be praying like it all depends upon God and acting like it all depends upon us. That's how we should view our prayer life. Remember, the armor of God are defensive weapons, and the word of God, offensive weapons. These are things that we choose to put on. There is action that is required. But without the power of prayer, all of those other things lose their power. Sometimes I get exhausted because you guys know my son woke me up super early. He slept all day uh, pretty much yesterday, fell asleep at 5 and slept all through the night. And guess what? Decides to wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning. He keeps doing that on Sundays, by the way. It drives me absolutely insane. So I make a bed on the floor, and he's climbing around. He's getting on me, and he's kicking the bed, and his feet are going up and down. He's going, da-da, da-da. It was funny. Angel went and got him this morning and brought him over, and she's like, shh. He climbs right up over to me, and he wants to snuggle and wrestle and have fun with Daddy. And I'm exhausted. I'm tired because I'm a human being, right? That happens. And uh, when I get up on Sunday morning, man, if I don't have a cup of coffee, it's really hard for me to engage and get my my power going, my, my life going. And that's the same way it is with prayer. I mean, imagine being a zombie spiritually throughout the day without the power of prayer. Prayer is like coffee. It does amazing things. I love coffee so much. Coffee is delicious. I need to cut back. There were some days I was drinking like five or six cups of coffee. And you guys already know I talk really fast, right? So coffee with me who I am naturally, it's just not really a good combination. But going through life without the power of prayer is going through life without food without substance, without energy. You're fatigued, you're exhausted. Prayer is what revitalizes us, the power of prayer. And so Paul says things like we read in Ephesians six eighteen: pray always with supplication and perseverance, persistence. He says, continue earnestly in prayer, be vigilant with thanksgiving, pray without ceasing. And so if you can think of it like this, right? This is the armor of God. We are soldiers in God's army. 
prayer is listening to the commands of the master. It's always connecting with the commander in charge. Imagine going to work and never getting feedback from your boss. Never having to touch base about which direction you should go or what should be happening. Imagine being somebody in the military and never touching base with your commanding officer. Where's the direction? Where should I go? What should I do? What's the perspective on this? What kind of information can he give me to bring relevance to this situation? And that's the same way it is in the army of God. When it comes to your kids and your marriages and your place of work, when it comes to your hobbies, when it comes to your life and what you should be doing, the power of prayer provides our ultimate direction as long as we're in line with the word of God. And so Paul says, I want you to pray. I want you to be busy doing spiritual things so you won't be doing sinful things. And I want you to be connected through the power of prayer. Now, let me give you some examples. This is why prayer is so powerful. First of all, there is forgiveness from God through prayer. Have you ever messed up and made a mistake as a Christian? Have you ever sinned and fallen short? You ever forgot to pray? Forgot to read your Bible? Sinned in your mind, in your heart, or even with your body? Have you ever messed up as a Christian? We all do that. The early church struggled with their sin as Christians, just like we do today. But you know what John says? And this is just a command to Christians, right? Some people make the mistake of taking this passage of Scripture and applying it to everyone. But here's what John says. He says this in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, being to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So here's what I want to do if I'm Satan, okay? I want to get you to fall short and to sin. And then... I don't want to just jab you with causing you to sin. I want to do a combination punch. You guys know what combination punches are, right? It's not just jabbing. It's when you connect certain punches together to get ultimate damage to the other individual. And so here's what I want you to do. I want to drive you away from praying to God because you're so focused on your sin rather than your Savior. That's my objective. That's what I want to accomplish. But yet the word says if we are willing to go to God and confess our sins to him, as a Christian, we are promised he is faithful and he will cleanse us and he will forgive us. Peter preached this in Acts 8, 22. He said to this Simon the sorcerer who really just wanted to manipulate the power of the apostles for their own gain. Here's what Peter preached. Repent, therefore, of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for the intent of your heart. You ever had bad intentions in your heart? I have with your spouse and church, with your kids. Are we not the most selfish people that we know? (laughs) Is it not absolutely true? Whether it comes to our money or our time, we can be selfish people and evil and messed up. But yet if we are willing to turn to God, God's willing to forgive us. But we have to turn away from our wickedness. It's the power of prayer. Number two, here's the power of prayer. There is peace from God. You know, prayer brings healing to anxiety. I mean, this has actually been clinically researched by medical professionals that people who meditate and pray actually have physical healing and well-being. Prayer is one of the most powerful things that you can do for your body if you're willing to pray, talk to God, and to meditate. Prayer is powerful. I struggle with anxious thoughts. I struggle with praying regularly, and I'm I'm in the ministry. Like, this is like my job, what I'm supposed to do. And it's difficult. Life is busy. Sin is tempting. We get messed up in our head and in our minds, but yet we can have true peace from God. Here's what Paul had to say in Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. It was just this last Monday. I was having some anxious thoughts, just about different things, really concerned about certain things, really worried, and I just took time to pray. And I spent just 20 minutes, I didn't even know, I just prayed, and I ended up getting into Thanksgiving. And I just started thanking God for my kids, and my wife, and my ministry, the job here, my body, my health, my income, my home. I mean, I just started going through all different things of prayer, and my anxiety just started to subsidize and close. And I was just at peace. God, you're in control. You know my anxious thoughts. You know my worries. Now, let us not make the mistake of thinking that prayer is the answer to mental illness or certain types of disorders. In fact, I did get a question this week about something I had said before, talking about demon possession. Demon possession is real. 
And the statement that I made is that demon possession should not be mistaken for mental illness. Mental illness is real. And one of the things that the church has classically done is often pushed off mental illness as demonic possession. That Christians who struggle with mental illness, anxieties, and disorders are just really possessed by the devil. And that is absolutely false. Mental illness is real. Some people need medication. Everyone should be getting some type of deep intensive therapy for their disorders or their mental illness. We should never just pop a pill and just think that that's going to solve everything. We need some type of intensive therapy to go along with our medication. But prayer is certainly a part of that. And so I want to make it crystal clear and very much clarify. I have had people in my family, and I do have people in my family, who struggle with mental illness and mental disorders. And prayer isn't the all and all answer. Mental illness is real, but so is demonic possession. And sometimes the two can be referenced as one and the same thing when they're not. Okay? And so we can really receive peace from God. And so here's my question. Do you want the peace of mind and heart that surpasses all understanding? And if everything else is right, turn to prayer. Number three, there is strength from God. You know, Paul, when he wrote some of his epistles, he was in prison. And the prison systems were a lot different then than they are now, right? We spend millions, if not billions of dollars on our prison systems, helping people, uh, taking care of people, feeding people. A ton of money goes into our prison systems. Back then, you couldn't eat unless somebody brought you food. You were locked and chained, sitting on a floor next to a Roman guard 24-7. You didn't get to go outside for an hour activity. Prison was a whole lot different then than it is now. And so Paul is writing these epistles from prison, and he's encouraging us to rejoice, to praise God, to give thanks. But ultimately, he says, my source of strength comes from prayer. Philippians chapter 3, Paul writes this. He says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that out of the riches of his glory he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now to him who is able to do infinitely more than all we can imagine, according to his power that is at work where? Within us. Paul says, I get on my knees and I pray that God's power may work in you. Power that you can't imagine. Strength that you can't imagine. But you can't get it unless you do what? You pray. The strength of God can come through prayer. And so the question is this. Do you want the power that is beyond comprehension? If you do want strength and power from God to make it through whatever you're going through, the answer is prayer. There is opportunity from God. You know, Paul realized this. He knew in God's providence that certain doors in his life would not open up unless he petitioned for them in prayer. And that is absolutely true. Sometimes God answers yes, sometimes God answers no, and sometimes God answers not yet. But there are circumstances and situations that will not open up, that God will not intervene in unless we pray for it. If you're willing to pray, I will open that door for you to walk through. And Paul knew that. Paul had this to say. In Colossians chapter 4, he says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Watchful and thankful as you pray for us that God may open to us a door for what? For the word. So that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. He's writing this from prison. Pray that I may declare it clearly as I should. Isn't that interesting? It's kind of a reoccurrent theme of Paul, isn't it? He said it in Ephesians 6. He's saying it again here in Colossians 4. Pray that I may preach the word with boldness. Not with arrogance. Not with vindictiveness. Not with maliciousness. But with boldness. Paul said in in Romans 1.16, I am unashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God that leads unto salvation. If you're not praying to share the word with people, are you missing it? If you're not praying to demonstrate the truthfulness of God's word with people in your life, are we missing it? There's a reason why Paul wanted to preach the word. There's a reason why Paul asked for strength and power and courage to declare the word. If I'm busy doing spiritual things, I won't be doing sinful things. And so we can have opportunity from God. There are times Angel and I have prayed for jobs. We've prayed for health. We've prayed for healing. 
We've prayed for intervention and situations and circumstances. We've prayed for truth. Truth would be known in certain cases. I mean, there are things that we have gone to God with in prayer. And sometimes it happens, and other times God is silent. And there are many times when it hasn't been years until God answered our prayers. Have you ever prayed and you're like, oh, it worked? <laughs> you got to kind of get caught off guard like, uh-oh, the prayer worked. I need, to, I need to pray more for this. You know, maybe I'll hit the lottery or something selfish. Yeah, it doesn't work like that, right? How many of you have prayed that you would hit the lottery? Be honest. Raise your hand. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> Hey, look, I've prayed for it before. We do lotto times at like Christmas. We get a few scratch-offs or whatever and buy like, you know, one ticket. And I'm like, Lord Jesus, if it's in your providence, please let me hit the lotto. Isn't that awful? Come on, let's just be real. We've prayed for some pretty weird, messed up things before. And if you haven't, you probably don't pray too much. (laughs) We're selfish people all the time. But we need to pray that God's word would be at work. There is boldness that comes from God. We should not only pray for the opportunity to share the word, but we should pray for the boldness to share the word. One of my favorite passages of scriptures in Acts chapter 4, where Peter um, is boldly proclaiming the word of God with, with John, and he just can't stop. In fact, he's arrested, thrown in prison, threatened with beatings. Ultimately, Peter would die for preaching the gospel. And Peter had this to say to the Jewish leaders, I cannot help myself but speak about the things that have taken place. I'm not going to stop, in other words. You will have to kill me if you want me to stop. I'm not stopping. And right after this, he goes into a time of prayer. Look at part of the prayer that he offers here in Acts chapter 4. He says, And now, Lord, consider their threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with complete boldness. Don't let me be afraid. Don't let me be in fear. Don't let me be arrogant and proud. Let me declare it with boldness and courage and fearlessness. As you stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And after they had prayed, their meeting place was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. The place actually shook after their prayer. Can you imagine if that would happen here? Our church would begin to shake after we were to pray. And I do want to take some time in our service. I do want us to pray, specifically for people who have lost their lives and their families at such horrendous acts of evil in Dayton, Ohio. I'm from Ohio and El Paso, Texas. I know we've got some people from Texas in here. I mean, they're just terrible things. So would you just join me as we just pray together um, for what took place? God, we come before you in boldness, Lord. And our hearts are broken. We're angry, uh, Father, at the pure evil of people who are so careless and thoughtless, vindictive and hateful, Lord, that they would take an innocent person's life for their own gain and for their own evil desires. God, I pray for those who have done that. Lord, I know that we should want forgiveness and mercy, and we can still have that, Lord, but God, I pray that our justice system would execute your divine wrath on these individuals who deserve death, who deserve punishment according to the law, and that they would be punished to the full extent of the law. God, more importantly, I pray for families, moms and dads, parents, brothers and sisters. God, I pray for those who are suffering in such a tremendous way that words are just simply unspeakable, God. And I'm sure they're angry and afraid. God, I'm sure that they're asking you so many questions, but God, I pray that you would intervene and you would bring peace to their soul. God, I pray that you would bring perspective. We know this world is filled with evil, and we know it's not what you want, and we know it's not what you intended, but God, we know you became a part of the evil, and one day you will banish all evil from ever taking place. God, help bring clarity to our own mind why you permit and allow these types of things to happen. Give us your peace. Give us your strength. Give us your perspective, Lord. Give us your power. Help us boldly proclaim the word of God to our friends and our neighbors and take an opportunity to share love and truth with people that so desperately need it. God, I pray that you would create opportunities for this week for every single person in this room to share your word and your truth and your love, and your compassion. God, be at work. Father, help us. Teach us. We love you, Lord.
We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul asked for boldness from God. Peter asked for boldness from God. They want to declare the truth, and that's what we found in Ephesians 6. Pray under the influence of the Spirit at all times, with every kind of prayer and petition. Petitions are simply requests from God. Be alert. Persevere. Don't give up. Preach the gospel. When we pray, we can get wisdom from God. Through prayer comes wisdom. James had this to say in James chapter 1. He says, now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without doubting because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. He's double-minded and he's unstable. God says, look, if you're willing to pray, it's one of those if-then. If you're willing to pray and you don't doubt, I'll be able to give you wisdom. And that wisdom often comes from counsel of people who are wise. It often comes from the word of God through God's providence. He doesn't just like jolt something in our brain. God works through his providence to bring people into our life to bring perspective. Do you know what the difference is between experience and wisdom? Wisdom is learning from the experience of others. Experience is learning it for yourself. Wouldn't you rather have wisdom? Wouldn't you rather look into the word and to the people in your life to see which path they have, they have taken, the good things and the bad things, and make your decision from that? May we pray for God's wisdom as we make decisions in our life. And then finally, we can have healing from God and tranquility. You know, spiritual battle is something that is real. And Satan wants nothing more than for you to think that he doesn't exist and he is not real. And sometimes we are spiritually sick and we need help. And sometimes that help only comes through prayer and fasting, giving up food, giving up things so that you may see the face of God. James said this in James 5, 16, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you will be healed. And the prayer of a righteous man has great power to prevail. There are some of you who are in a spiritual battle and you are so afraid to reach out to other people to ask them for prayer. Don't hesitate. Don't let Satan convince you that people don't care and won't pray. Prayer can ultimately be a very powerful answer to your spiritual sickness. And then look at what Timothy had, Paul had to say to Timothy. He says in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, First of all then, I urge that petitions and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be offered on behalf of all men. And look at for who? For kings and all of those in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness with dignity. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Do you know that we should be praying for our leaders, people who are in positions of authority. Why? According to Paul. So that we can be at peace. So that we can lead lead tranquil lives. When's the last time you prayed for President Trump? When's the last time you prayed for his cabinet members? When's the last time you prayed for your local authorities, people who are in positions of authority here in Maryland, our governors, our leaders, our congressmen, our senators. And we may not always agree with their policies or their stances, but that doesn't mean we still shouldn't pray. Because I think we can all stand on the side that we don't want this type of violence to take place, like in El Paso, Texas, and in Ohio, right? Isn't that a position that all of us can take? Do we really want riots in the streets? Do we really want to go without food? Do we really want to be at war? No. May God give our leaders the wisdom and the understanding that comes from his word, that they may receive power through prayer, and that we, as his people, would be people of prayer. Let's end by praying for people in authority together this morning.